All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Studio Bridge. Uh, <clears throat> we are here for the first of four nights with uh, Francis Vallejo, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, if you um, if you don't know Francis's work, you're going to know a lot more about it uh, or know a lot about it after this evening. And I promise you, you will learn a tremendous amount in this month. Um, I will introduce Francis a little bit more formally here in just a minute. But we have his first, uh, his first job with us was to choose the celebrity portrait, uh, the challenge for last month. And we had 14 really great uh, pieces submitted. Uh, there was some back and forth. I watched, uh, I submitted all the work to Francis and I watched him struggle over a few of the pieces, which is always healthy. It's excellent work, but it came to this conclusion. And the winner this last month is AJ. So uh, fantastic piece. Um, <laughs> great execution. I love this painting. Um, really, really well done. No doubt it's Mick, right? Um, but really distorted. Uh, a distorted Mick, which it's kind of kind of where his face has led him uh, the last 20 years. <laughs> so um, uh, I, yeah, I, I hope I can be around as long as him. Uh, so um, let's get down to business. Congratulations, AJ. Uh, thank you much for everybody for contributing to the uh, participating. Uh, there was some really beautiful work and it was a tough decision. So um, let's, let's get back to Francis here. And um, I met Francis and 2006 or 2007, uh, one of the two, I think 2006, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, he attended the Illustration Academy, um, did so pat badly, he had to come back the next year and attend it again. <laughs> I'm saying that jokingly. He, did, he, uh, he, he saw its value and he came back and attended again. A lot of people have gone to that multiple. Some people I know they've gone to three and four times. Um, uh, Francis is, was an absolute standout as a student, um, won the uh, Arthur Zankel Award um, when he was a junior at uh, Ringling, which is the highest, which is the best illustration done for a junior in art and design college, um, won several other scholarships uh, along the way, um, and was just a total standout. Um, he was, when I met Francis, I always, I always chuckled. He was the guy that was covered in paint the most. He had paint on him all the time. Uh, and he was very much in, into what he was doing. Um, a, a really, really, really great student. And you could see good things were coming his way. Um, and it, and they certainly have. I know Francis, uh, this is from your Nazis, uh, Nazi boys, correct? Um, yep. the Neil Gaiman, uh, book. Um, he, he, Francis has won awards at uh, Spectrum, Society of Illustrators, has appeared in um, print magazine, or excuse me, uh, Communication Arts Magazine. Um, he's got all the accolades, um, and I'm very, very proud of him. I remember presenting uh, his, his uh, medal to him at the, at the Spectrum, standing on stage, and I couldn't help from just crying. <laughs> it was, it was, was a good moment. moment. It was a good moment. <laughs> uh, so, um, Francis, thank you for doing this. I pulled some images, like just four or five images, that I think uh, I just wanted to show people the, you know, the, 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 the multitude of directions you go in. Uh, beautiful figurative work, uh, great book work. Um, great, uh, more, more great figurative work, uh, comic work. And that's kind of where you started at the beginning. Uh, I know that was a true love of yours and um, uh, very, very good at it. And I think this is a, another piece from the, from the first book, um, but just absolutely gorgeous work and you're all in for a treat. So Francis, hello. I'll let you do all the talking now. I'll just ask questions along the way. Everybody feel free to ask questions. I'll moderate and, and answer them when I think it's, or uh, ask them when I think it's appropriate, appropriate interrupt. But um, welcome and thank you so much, Francis. Well, that was very, very kind, John. You know, anytime you need anything, I'm happy to, to talk to the folks around the Visual Arts Passage and Illustration Academy. They were really 
instrumental in my uh, development. So this is all one of the things I didn't mention that I should have, but I, I, I just kind of kicked myself for not thinking about it. And that is, you and I have had a relationship of teaching too. Um, Francis is a student, um, obviously, you know, I, I, I was paying attention to what he was doing, what he was doing as a young professional. And I invited him into my world uh, to teach. He's visited the academy and taught at the academy. He taught in my first online uh, program. He was a studio lead in the first um, online incarnation of our art education that it's become this and um, or become the visual arts passage. And um, I was always very confident and trusted Francis just because he was committed to what he was doing. And uh, he's a serious, I always looked at him as a serious, serious artist and uh, he always delivered for me. And I like to think that, you know, Francis teaches at um, College for Creative Studies now in Detroit. I, I had a little bit of something to do with him getting that job. I put his name into the arena and um, I'm so, I'm very, very proud of him. So and now it's all your yeah. I just had, I just had to throw that last bit in there. Well, I appreciate it. And, and teaching is really important to me. And we're going to talk about how that aspect of my career, I found myself doing that and kind of where I stand with, with education at this point. Um, so everybody, I, I'm sure you don't want to see my face. I have a lot of art. So let me get through the technical side here. So let me share my screen. Screen two. A little uh, Paul Pope background there. There you go. Yes. We want it. Hold on one second. That's starting way too far. You're getting a sneak preview of everything. And this was Francis's first assignment out of school. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was, we'll talk about that. I was able to study with uh, Mr. Paul Pope at one point. All right, so let's try this one more time. I was referring to the jazz days that you were showing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a bit. That looks like the beginning right there. <laughs> this is the first one, yeah. All right, everyone, so we're going to go on an adventure here. Uh, I'm going to show you the good and bad of my journey from this little goofball here to the current goofball that's on your screen. Uh, again, I, I'm just I'm so honored to be here and, and, and to have your ears for a bit. So how I want to structure this is I'm going to show various elements of my work, and then we'll get into more specific projects at the end. Uh, this presentation is coming at a really interesting time in my career where I feel like I'm transitioning into phase two. Phase one was the time from art school until maybe last year or so where I was trying to figure out really where my voice was and the type of work I wanted to do, but more importantly, how I wanted to live as an artist. And I'm going to reference those real life elements, like how to structure your day and, and the, how your personality works with certain type of projects uh, quite a bit in my presentation. And now at 36 years old, I have a lot of answers to those questions and it took me a while to get there and I want to talk about those things and when I wrap up, uh, I'm going to give some insight into where I want to take my work and I have a little lecture on the future of art, commercial art and artificial intelligence. Uh, as John mentioned, I am a teacher so I put together that lecture to send my seniors off because I think if you're paying attention to commercial art, that's becoming a huge conversation. So I'm excited to, to talk to everyone about that. All right, so here is the first image chosen on purpose. This was uh, me wearing a funny hat, making faces, got a Ghostbusters shirt on. Uh, I still try to do that today. Maybe I should have my, my hat on, but kind of showing off my newfound long hair. <laughs> Um, but I, I work in a variety of different industries. Now, some of these represent industries I worked in at the beginning of my career. I've since more focused on comics and books. Um, that's why they're in red right here. But to get to this point, I did have the good fortune of trying a lot of different types of picture making out. 
Uh, so I'm a Detroit kid. Uh, I actually was born in New Mexico, but I don't remember that because my family moved to Detroit when I was three. So the red dot shows where I, um, where I was raised. Uh, it was on Eight Mile. I feel like we have people from all over the place, all over the world in this chat. But uh, if you're like, hey, is that right where Eminem was at? It was. Uh, it was a couple blocks from the house Eminem had on Eight Mile. So um, that's always a claim to fame. But I, I did grow up in that area and it, it had a, a big influence on me and it still does. Uh, these other dots, it's not really important to too many folks, but uh, this just shows my journey uh, in that now I teach at the Blue Dot here at the College for Creative Studies, and then I live here. So I was able in my 20s uh, to move all over the country, but where I started in Detroit is where I'm at now, and I'm really excited for it. So when I was a kid, um, in the red dot there on the top, this was my life. Uh, these were the things that I was really interested in. Uh, Spawn came out in the early 90s, and my absolute favorite artist uh, was Todd McFarlane, who's still doing it. I think his Spawn comic just went over issue 300. It was independent. And honestly, looking back at my early awareness that Todd was equal part entrepreneur and artist, I did notice that. And one of the reasons I'm an artist is I had an old VHS video of McFarlane. And he said that when you're drawing the chest of a muscular superhero, and when you go through the deltoids around the pack and back, that forms a W. And I remember thinking, wait, you just, because everyone would talk about artists are just naturally good, right? I'm like, wait a minute, there's actually things that you can study and get better at art. It's just not sorcery that you're born with. That was a really big deal. And that was in the early 90s. Um, I was really growing up around this area. This is the house a couple blocks from me. So hip hop was really big. Uh, and I remember seeing this commercial here for some shoes. So all these things combined uh, pushed me towards realizing that I, I would want to pursue art. Uh, my other interests were to either, to either be a rapper, which would be a horrible idea. No one wanted to hear that. Or a basketball player. But being six foot in Detroit meant I had to be a point guard. And uh, I didn't have the ball handling skills to make that happen. So I decided to pursue um my heart, I was, which I was always doing. Funny story is, this is one of my favorite stories, the school that I teach at uh, didn't give me a scholarship when I applied. I probably could have got in maybe, um, but it would have been a struggle because primarily they said after they critiqued my work that I need to work on my composition. And I told them, well, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me what composition is? So fast forward however many years, I was maybe 17 at that time, I teach composition at the College for Creative Studies, um, and the room where I found out I wanted to go to Ringling is the room I teach composition in. So, you know, that, that's sort of a fun narrative that if there's anything that you're struggling with now, you might become an expert on it in the future if you put the appropriate uh, energy into it, and I truly believe that. Um, so anyways, these pieces here were my earliest pieces at art school. Uh, I did a lot of graffiti in Detroit. Um, my tag was matter M at sign R. I thought I was very clever. Uh, I put the piece on the right because this is a very over-exaggerated self-portrait, but it was actually the very first time I'd ever used digital art. This was a charcoal drawing in my freshman year, and I scanned it into Photoshop, which was new. I had never scanned anything. And then I opened Photoshop, which is new. <laughs> I'd never done that. So of course, I immediately went to the filters. And I'm like, wow, you can take a hand-done thing and then tweak it. And as you're going to see to this day, taking a hand-done thing and tweaking it digitally is a big part of my process. So there's a lot of foundation that I would build on. So just a bunch more pieces from my early time at, at art school. And this was a big deal because I didn't have much art education in high school. Uh, the high school itself was decent, but the art program was not. Uh, actually, we had two teachers get fired. One teacher stole my money for the scholastic art competition. So my senior year in high school, I just drew in the boiler room because they didn't really have an art program. So when I went to art school and was then surrounded by so many other passionate people that like to draw, uh, that was huge. And I really went for it. You know, I'm like, this is what I've been waiting for, particularly these pieces here. The reason these are in the presentation is that this was near the end of freshman year and we had the opportun opportunity to take a workshop. 
Um, I had only drawn just using basically graphite, uh, uh, graphite pencil going into art school, right? So there was a, a massive painting workshop just for a week, and they give you a giant board of masonite and said you can do whatever you want. So I had never barely painted and did anything that big. And these were the pieces that resulted from it, which was inspired by a graffiti artist that I really liked at the time called Dave Kinsey, who's still, still doing work, really good work. But the reason I put these in here is because there was a moment where I realized I was covered in paint around other people that were excited to draw and paint, listening to music at the time, just early 2000s hip hop, uh, and having the time of my life. And I thought, wow, can you live a life where you're covered in paint, dancing around, listening to music, and just getting excited about something, a shared interest with other people? Like I never experienced that before. And it was that moment that I knew I was on the right path. And then very ironically, I stopped. <laughs> um, so this was definitely one of the big uh, stumbling blocks. So this is obviously 3D work. And this was uh, done in Maya because when I applied to art school, I knew I wanted to draw. And I was interested in illustration, but my advisor gave me honestly bad advice um, after I was accepted because they said, well, there's not a lot of money in illustration we have a really successful animation program at Ringling. If you want to make some good money, you should do that. Now, I'm a broke as a joke, 18 year old. I'm like, sure, man, making some money with art. That sounds great, let's do that. Um, and that was, that was an error uh, because I found out I wasn't drawing too much. And what I was doing in the animation program tended to look decent because I put a lot of energy into the design of the animation, but it moved really bad. So I was like averaging a C minus because they weren't grading so much the, the visuals they were grading at the time, the, the animation. Um, and not so much that grades matter in, in art, but more so just to show you how I was received in the department. Um, they were confused, like why does he spend so much time like sketching out the pieces, right? So in my junior year in school, I took a visual development class at Ringling. And that class at the time was seen as a class you take as a supplement on the side to support your animation final projects. And I swiftly put all my energy into it. Um, I was starting to fail my animation projects because I was putting so much time into this, these pieces here. Um, I was becoming more confident in the computer because I just, the major was called computer animation. It was completely digital. Um, so these pieces were created without much picture making instruction. Um, I was just looking at a lot of art, particularly this one. Uh, another really good story, my favorite artist in the world was John Foster, who I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with, um, who works a lot with Visual Arts Passage and Illustration Academy. And I was, had the fortune of studying with him at the academy. I now consider John a friend which is one of the great joys in my life. Um, but when I was 21 years old, aspiring art student, I basically ripped them off um, and I did this piece. I was still an animation major and I had some illustration buddies say I should, I should submit it to Spectrum, uh, the, the fantastic art composite, uh, competition. Uh, I did, I had no idea what I was doing, but I'm like, sure, I'll submit it. And then it got in and I thought, wow, it's easy to get into Spectrum, <laughs> which it's, it's not. That was a huge honor. I was just so ignorant. Um, that was one of the nudges I needed to think maybe I might be an illustrator. I was pretty dense. Uh, it, I knew how much art school cost. Um, I, I thought, well, I, I was raised to always finish what you start, and I was really nervous to, to leave animation. Um, and it took me until about a week before the semester started, where I remember going on the Ringling website and looking up the phone number and office hours of the chair of illustration at Ringling. Uh, I remember giving them a call and saying, hey, my name is Francis Vallejo. Uh, I think I might want to switch into your major. Uh, I sent over my work and they accepted me. 
And that was one of the biggest moments of my life, one of the biggest decisions, because instead of feeling like an imposter animator, I switched where I felt like I was home. And the technical side of that meant I had to redo my junior year so I could take some classes. Uh, fortunately, they didn't make me redo my sophomore year, but I say fortunately, just financially speaking. The interesting thing is at Ringling, sophomore year is where you learned most of the picture making foundations. I didn't get that. So I relied on a lot of study of work independently to figure out composition, similar to this piece on the right inspired by Norman Rockwell and the image on the left by Tomer Hanuka and the piece on the bottom by Josh Cochran. So I was just soaking in uh, inspiration. And if you consider the time that this happened in 2007, eight, sharing art online was new. It's, and that's crazy, right? All of us just see thousands of images a day. A lot of it illustration, right? We're probably following a ton of artists, but that was a new thing. I had never experienced that before. So I was just absorbing everything. Um, and it wasn't until though the Academy that I went, Illustration Academy with John that I went on a couple years later that I actually start to learn some of the picture making rules. Uh, my work was very digital because that's just what I knew. I, I had spent the last couple of years just getting really familiar with digital tools. Um, although at around that time, and we're gonna come full circle here again, I was doing caricatures. Uh, when I would go back home to Detroit in the summer, I would work at the Detroit Zoo and basically draw people in markers in like a cartooning style. So that experience of doing stylized animation work, caricatures, now being an illustration, I really brought that desire to exaggerate into my illustrative work um, and interest in people like Norman Rockwell, et cetera. And I was trying to find, well, where does my aesthetic sit? And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some of my current caricature work so, because I still do it. It's a wonderful art form. Um, I should mention actually this piece on the right because it's an important part of my story because of how it was distributed. So the time was 2007-ish. The primary platform for sharing art online was Blogspot. It was a blog, it was the era of blogs. I had started my Blogspot to show my parents artwork. It was so innocent, you know, uh, my parents didn't have email. So I'm like, if there's a website they can go, they can sign on to their 56K modem <laughs> and wait 20 minutes, but see some of the art I made, which was a very novel, exciting idea. What happened is a bunch of people started doing that. And on accident, I was in that early wave of artists sharing the work online. The artist that was running the show at that time online was James Jean. The artist that's running the show online in 2022 is also James Jean. So <laughs> he's been at it for a while. But I was noticing how James was sharing his work. So back to this piece on the right, uh, this was Kanye West and Pharrell and Lupe Fiasco, who I listened to a lot of their music. And it didn't occur to me that slapping the Vibe magazine logo on the front of this and putting it online, that people might actually think I did it, the cover for Vibe, which I very much did not. But it started to float around online and eventually I got in touch with the art director of Vibe and my first illustration job when I was in art school was for Vibe magazine. So that experience was really interesting because it was such a wild west of illustrators sharing their work online that I started to see that there's some opportunity doing that. And for what it's worth nowadays, I have those conversations with my seniors. But instead of being one of maybe a hundred artists like I was, probably a little more, but not many. Now they're one of a hundred thousand artists online. So figuring out how to market your work, not just online, but in person, et cetera, et cetera, is a big deal. And I caught a big break that I was able to leverage the internet early on. Um, so these were some of my first figure pieces in art school, and I'm going to start to move a little faster so I can get out of art school. Um, but the reason I show them is I went into my oil class with my oil paints and I, the medium to thin my oils with was water. So I didn't know what I was doing. So, cause no one had taught me oil painting. Everyone else in the class had earlier figure classes, but remember I transferred, right? So I was like, why is my oil slipping and sliding over the canvas? 
Um, so eventually I realized that Gamasol or Terp was the appropriate medium. Uh, and I went crazy and I rekindled my love for traditional artwork. And the idea of emotion and dynamic mark making started to take really noticeable um, priority in my, in my pieces. Also at the time, James Jean was just a, a sketchbook god. And all of us were too. Everyone in art school was just going crazy sketching in their sketchbook. And I continue to sketch today and I have some, actually a section where I show you some of those sketches, but I was doing things like this traditional piece here and then scanning it in and finishing it up digitally. Um, this piece was a class assignment, it was a big oil painting. And the fast story for this image on the right is that I was always broke in school and I would just ask in my loans a little extra so I can live off of it. But always at the end of the semester, I would run out of money. So I would go on to Craigslist in the creative section, which was a very dangerous thing to do, <laughs> um, to try to drum up 40 bucks, 50 bucks so that I can eat that week. So I wasn't getting any opportunities in the United States. So I reached out to a Craigslist ad in Paris, because you could do that, for a musician called Tony Williams. And uh, they needed a poster. They initially found out I was in art school. They didn't want to work, for, work with me, but they couldn't find anyone. So they're like, all right, kid, you can do our poster. I knew I had heard the name Tony Williams before. So as it turns out, he was Kanye West's cousin and was featured on all of Kanye's projects. So I know Kanye is a very controversial figure these days, but he's basically running the world at that time. Um, and I was a big fan of his music. So what ended up happening is I did all this poster work um, for Tony Williams and Kanye posted it on his blog. And Kanye at one point gave me a phone call to say that he liked the paintings. The reason I tell that story other than it being a very novel story is that I was receiving this affirmation that people like my work because when you're starting off, you're like, is anyone going to like this? Anyone going to want to hire me? And I was starting to get input that, that there might be people that, that would want to pay money or, or to hire me to do things, which was amazing. So the piece on the left was my very first professional illustration gig ever for uh, Vibe magazine that I mentioned. Uh, the piece on the right was me doubling down on traditional and, and digital. So this was an oil painting that I manipulated digitally. So this was a picture of me senior year. The senior that John mentioned covered in oil paint. It was true. I was very bleeding heart artist and would paint oil paint all day and wipe my brush on me and just walk around like that. <laughs> it was very, obnoxious. Very accurate depiction of you. And um, you mentioned a little something about being headstrong and committed. Uh, you were. <laughs> uh, you were extremely. Um, you had your team of artists that that uh, you really focused on. And uh, I one of the challenges, and this isn't this is not a negative thing. This is a this is a really positive thing, is that you were so committed to you know, to get you to look past Norman Rockwell at times uh, was was a hard thing and was a challenge. I remember talking about it with other instructors there. But when you did, when you figured out there's there's more to it than that, and you stay true to, you know, uh, to your loves, uh, the things that really inspired you. But you did you did eventually get out of that. And I think it was. Um, maybe a little bit more different. I, I, and again, I, I, I totally mean it as a, as a positive, not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to bring a negative into this conversation, but you were really committed and loved what you were looking at. And um, that's a good thing. Yeah. A hundred percent. And the timing, John, is really good because I'm going to talk about the Rockwell senior project that, that was a challenge and kind of taught me that lesson a hundred percent. And and I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but I think one of my greatest assets that's brought me any success was my pretty hardcore, relentless attitude to get better. And one of the biggest challenges in my life was to calm down that hardcore, relentless attitude to get better and just to be a relaxed human being. 
Um, so many years later, I think I found a little balance on that. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I, I was a handful at that time. Um, so we're going to get right to the end of my senior year. And, and I promise in a second, we'll go to my post school stuff. But around the end of art school, I was aggressively an oil painter. Uh, I had this idea in my head, like John mentioned, that um, Norman Rockwell is the greatest artist to ever live, which I'm still of that impression. Um, and I just was going to be a oil painting illustrator. So these are some of the pieces I was doing at that time to the point where this piece on the right was painted from life. I just had a friend pose. I got him a, a suit jacket at Goodwill. I was way too big for him. So we took like pins and pinned it. And he watched Lord of the Rings while I painted him completely from life because I had read that that's what Rockwell did. Um, and then you could see like the James Jean influence on the top. So I definitely wore my influences on my sleeve. Um, this piece is funny that I did both of these at the Illustration Academy. So the second time I had went, um, I was starting to get professional work. So I did this piece for an auction at the Society of Illustrators. And this was for a show at Gallery Nucleus. And this was actually the first piece I'd ever used a brush to ink. Um, John knows my good buddy, Dustin Darnall, incredible artist. Uh, late at night, he gave me an energy drink and his brush. And he's like, hey man, it's a cool sketch. You should try to just crank away on it and use a brush. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it took painting, but with ink, like this is incredible. So back to the Rockwell story, this was a huge uh, development character building moment for me. So as John mentioned, I was very fortunate to have had a positive, very positive art school experience. I, I had a number of recognitions that I was pleased to receive. So I was on top of the world, you know, it's by the Society of Illustrators and my department gave me, you know, like top senior award and I was having some professionals I really admired reach out to me and things seemed to be moving perfect. But uh, this image on the top left was a graphite sketch uh, that I had prepared for my senior thesis. And I thought, well, Norman Rockwell's my hero. So I'm gonna follow his exact process and do a painting in his sort of world um, of me learning to draw. So the scene was me as a little kid um, coloring in Scooby-Doo Scooby coloring book where my mom would cook tamales, some Mexican and Irish. My dad would come home from the factory. And so this was my kitchen. So when I went home for uh, Christmas break, I shot photos of everything. This was my, my German Shepherd dog. So I worked up this sketch that does have some tradition or um, digital touch-ups in it. I transferred it and I had a 40 by 60 painting that I didn't finish. So that was a really tough time because everyone, I had a lot of eyeballs on me and I didn't really go to my senior ex exhibition. Uh, I remember showing up, saying hi to George Pratt, my, my mentor and, and just good friend and someone I really respect. And then I basically left because I was embarrassed. Um, I think there were a lot of expectations to have a, a, a solid killer piece um, and, I, and I didn't finish it. And it was a very useful experience, but a very hard one at the time. And I say useful because I realized that to make a piece of artwork as serious as a Norman Rockwell style piece, there was a lot involved there. Um, and I was pretty hard on myself and I thought, well, if I'm not there yet, I better go to one of the most hardcore art schools in the world. And I applied to go after graduation and was accepted into the Repin Institute of Art in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, so the story with that is I was accepted. I got all my shots and I was ready to go, but they didn't accept scholarships uh, for international students at the time. I don't know today. So I sold everything I had. I remember putting up signs around town and on campus and I would sell sketchbooks and my pots and pans and my books. And I had some good books, that was tough. Uh, just everything. And I raised a couple thousand dollars, but I realized that you know, I wasn't gonna be able to make it. So another tricky spot. So after that, I called my parents and they were set on me being in Russia. And I says, hey, can I come home <laughs> the next week? 
And uh, of course they said, yeah. So I was back at my home in Detroit. And the stupid thing I did is that I had a lot of clients that were interested in, in working with me after graduation. And I had had conversations with them saying I was going to be overseas. So all the goodwill and marketing I had developed, I had told all those people I'm not available. And I felt weird saying, oh, you know, never mind, I'm, I'm available, which I did a couple of times, but that was a big hiccup. Um, and who helped me out of that was John English. Um, I remember getting a phone call saying that he has some opportunities in Kansas City and Austin and Richmond and would I be interested in any of them? And I thought Austin would be cool. I knew nothing about it, but uh, that's what happened. So I went to Austin, Texas, and I was a studio lead for John. It's an amazing opportunity to kind of set the culture of the studio uh, and to help the students and also work on my own work. Um, I did that for maybe two and a half years. Then I made the decision that I needed to be the worst artist in the room. And that's an important idea that I want to articulate a little bit more. So what I mean is, I think you always want to surround yourself with artists better than you. And I'm not saying that that wasn't the case in Austin at any means. There was a stunning amount of great artists, but I knew George Pratt existed <laughs> and he was my ultimate mentor and I respected him so much. So I thought if I can be around George Pratt more, I can scare myself into getting better because you can't draw next to George and not want to draw better. He's just that good. So I had reached out to George and said, um, would you be into it? It was more like shaking, my hand shaking on the phone. Like, George, can I move to Sarasota and share a studio with you? I seriously, and he, you know, if you know George, he's like, yeah, man, you know, yeah, cool. Um, I couldn't believe it. That was the best day ever. So I did. I, I left uh, Austin to Sarasota and I shared a studio with George and it was amazing. Um, did some printmaking, did some plein air painting, and I did my first book there. Um, and I don't have it down here. I need to update the slide, but let me just finish this timeline and bring it current. Then we can look at a lot more work. So after that point, uh, this is going to start sad and finish very positively. Um, my dad had got really sick. So right at that time, uh, I got a message from the chair of the illustration department of the College for Creative Studies who was put into contact uh, by John English again. So, you know, John's, John's always really looked out. I'm very lucky to have had him in my life and continue to. Um, and check this out. Is this crazy or what? That when my dad got really sick and I decided I wanted to move back to Detroit, that the art college in Detroit, what we're looking for an illustration full-time instructor and happened to reach out to me within a couple of days of me finding that news. It's one of the craziest um, events that, that has ever happened. So I did realize well, this, seemed, this seems like a really smart thing to do. And I was still unsure about teaching at the time, but I thought this is my best option. So I'm gonna do it. Um, and it worked out great. And my father is in excellent health. Everything's good to go. And I continue to teach at CCS. And man, that was seven, eight years ago now. So. I'm not the, the new, fresh, young blood in the department. There's actually people younger than me now. Um, and that's up to current, right? So now let's look at a whole bunch of artwork that I've been doing since that time, uh, after graduation. All right, so as I go through my work, I'm going to note that I'm very aware that I have quite a bit of experimentation. Um, as far as mediums and styles and aesthetics. And I think that as you look through this, uh, ask how committed are you to developing a singular style or experimentation? And I have a lot to talk about on the pros and cons of that. And that's not to say you can't brand yourself one way and experiment in other styles, but I think that's just an idea that a lot of people are working through. And you can, you're about to see a ton of images um, where I'm doing the same, just trying a lot of different things. So the image on the left was a private commission of Madison, Washington. The image on the right was a 
um, uh, silk screen poster. Uh, this piece here was just a digital test. I don't do really much completely digital work, but I just wanted to see what I could do when I did. So this just shows some of that. Uh, the image on the left was for Fine Magazine. Uh, the image on the right was a pitch for the New Yorker that they really liked, but they realized the timing was off. I pitched this too late into the season, uh, and that was a good lesson there. But both of these, both of these pieces were gouache with a little digital touch up. Uh, this is a piece uh, so a private commission. Uh, this is basically just stealing George Pratt's method of ink and varnish and oil paint. Another digital piece just playing around. This one was more of a test. Uh, this is the cover of Hornbook Magazine, really influenced by um, Hirschfeld, Al Hirschfeld and, and Gary Kelly. Uh, and this involved me learning airbrush, which I'm continuing to play with. Everything from the 80s is back, including airbrush. I have a number of students that that's their favorite tool to use. Uh, this was a piece that was just bought by Mercedes here in Detroit, in one of their buildings. Uh, I did this piece after going to a Picasso exhibit and it had to do with mad cow disease. Francis, I give you a little heads up. I, 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 I'll point it out to you. I'll send you the link to, to uh, Dale Stefanos did an airbrush demonstration in here a couple of weeks ago. It was great. Um, and, he, and again, it's like, I don't think I've ever seen anybody I've always, the people I knew that used airbrush were always used it as flat, you know, put down flat tones and change values, that type of thing. Yeah. And he could render with the thing so beautifully. He was just amazing. Um, so uh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. You'll, have to take, you'll have to take a look at it. It's pretty good. Where's Dale based out of, John? He's in Boston or Foxborough. Okay. I'd love if you'd let me get into a studio to ask him some questions because I'm trying to step up my. Um... My, my airbrush. It's a really exciting tool. Well, you should talk to him. He's an extremely open individual to talk, talk, to, talk to. Definitely. So, you know, a few pieces like this were a demonstration. And for what it's worth, this is the demo I did to get my job at CCS. And I really thought I got to show him what I'm made of. So a lot of this was really crazy you know like the white here is I took the tube itself and I didn't squeeze the paint out and then apply it with the brush I just took the tube and like a toothpaste and was like and so that's like a half inch thick mark here and I was just pulling things around with some tools trying to be as expressionistic as possible um, and that's still really important to me uh, and as we'll see later with artificial intelligence and the idea of purposeful mistakes and unexpected happy accidents, big conversation that we're going to keep talking about. But I was really trying to play with that. And I had an idea of the values and the design I wanted for the piece, but the media experimentation was pretty fun. Uh, so this was a piece I did for a, for a charity for um, elephant fundraising. Uh, this was some, this is a self portrait at the time. Uh, and the white around the piece was pickling paint, which I've turned a number of people onto it, and it's awesome. You can get it at Home Depot. And what it is, is it's for woodworkers that want to make fake antiques. So say you get a, uh, you make a new bench, you put the pickling uh, white on the bench and sand it down a little bit. And it's a consistency that lets you see some of the the grain underneath of it, but it tints it kind of unevenly with white. And if you use it on your painting, it can have this really creamy, semi-translucent uh, feel to it. It's really satisfying. So a lot of the texture in this piece was, was accomplished by that. And this was me starting to try to bring the very clean-ish world of ink and then bring a little bit more textured quality to it. Well, I should say this, uh, Francis, I'll give you the warning, your boss is in the room. So um, Don Kilpractic wrote, <laughs> uh, long before you did this demo, I knew you were the right person to, to join our department. Love seeing <laughs> all this together again. Um, and amazing and amazing as always. Well, it's very kind. If, if Hopefully everyone knows Don's work, but I'm 
it's honored to be around one of the best printmakers in the United States. And Don, I got to get in your studio to try the giant one pretty soon. Um, so this was another piece that I was a little thicker with the, uh, the pickling paste and you can see how it's kind of like dripping here. So these were portraits for a book project that I'll show a little later that I've been kind of working on and off on for quite some time. Uh, so figure has been really important to me for a long time because I feel like all of us have aspects of art that we like or that that comes a little more naturally in other parts where we have to like bleed from our eyes. <laughs> Um, for instance, to give an analogy, um, I really love athletics and fitness and all that stuff. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people and across the board, it seems a lot of people like uh, weightlifting generally. And a lot of people have a hard time with running, I suppose, that at least I've encountered. Um, so, but both of them are, are very useful. And as I say this analogy, I'm not sure if it's the perfect one to make, but the point I'm going for is that with picture making and illustration, sometimes I can bleed from the eyes and it takes so much effort and it's absolutely worth it. And I'm here because I love it. But with figurative work, it just comes naturally. I don't even have to think about it. It's about the most joyful act I have as an artist. Um, and I try to do it as much as I can. And I'm very fortunate to teach figure classes at the college I'm at and even this summer. Um, I was able to arrange weekly figure sessions so I can just regularly stay in front of the model. Well, so you, these are some of those. It pieces. definitely shows in the work, Francis. It looks like you love it. It, it, it. You do an amazing job with it. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's, I, I tell my students, because I have freshmen and I'm able to pollute them with good ideas or at least what I consider good ideas very early on. It's the only, illustration type class. And I just tell them that it's very simple. It, take as many figure classes as you can and use it as a subject, comp a very complex subject where you can learn to draw and design well. You can kind of learn everything with, with the figure. And that's why it's so emphasized in illustration programs for forever. It's just, it is that important. Um, and I have found that advice to be very worthwhile. Um, because a number of my most successful students almost across the board um, took all of our possible figure classes and they could draw really well. So I should, I, should I should probably say this. I, I haven't since both you and Don are here. Um, I, did a, I did a talk recently where I talked about prepping and preparing for college and um, the as a BFA program. And, and there's all kinds of reasons why people approach art school differently. Obviously, we're non-traditional, but as a BFA program, they they got the goods. I mean, it's, it, it is the, I think it's not only the best program, it's the best value. If you have the opportunity to do that, that is the, um, in my mind, the premier program <laughs> in the country. And it's tough for me to say that because some of my best friends teach at other schools, but um, I, I truly believe it is, it is an amazing, it is, is a great program. Thanks, John. I'm really, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really proud of what we're able to do there. Um, and we just keep, we're, we're trying to move forward. Um, I think y'all can hear my dog barking in the background, probably. It's probably distant, a little squeak. Is the uh, feeder, is it time? <laughs> is it, you warned me that the, that the feeder was, the automatic feeder was going to go off. Right around this time, yeah. It's, she's just not going to relent. She has to go to the bathroom after she eats. So um, let's figure this out. Everyone here's, uh, let me actually go to another slide. So these are just more figure pieces, a little bit more experimental. Um, but there's one slide on, I want to specifically stop at. More stylized, straightforward. This one. So when I come back, I want to discuss the difference, differences between these two approaches. So um, if everyone could hold tight for maybe a minute or two, I just got to manage my screen right now. <laughs> Okay. Um, Go take care of what you have to take care of, and uh, we'll we'll take care of uh, the room. Sure. 
Yeah, and everyone think about how these pieces are a little different because I want to kind of go on a tangent and talk about that. All right, I'll be right back. Great. I hope you all are playing, paying close attention. This is somebody who's devoted his life to this, <laughs> to the the craft of drawing, uh, and 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 designing. And I I'm um, I never hesitate to show uh, Francis as an example of somebody that did it right um, and continues to do it right. You know, I I refer to Francis as a is a very serious artist, somebody that um, uh, puts everything into it, and it definitely is coming out the other side. It definitely shows. Um, if um, come, maybe I can talk about Francis when he's not in the room. <laughs> um, that 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 I, I really I hope I. I hope that came off as a positive thing. I was talking about his his uh, devotion to a group of artists that he kind of looked at his team and Norman Rockwell was leading the charge. Norman Rockwell still very influential on his work. And I, I agree with Francis. I don't think he's the greatest artist that ever lived. I think he's the greatest illustrator that ever lived. I don't think anybody can you know the the opportunity he had the uh, the 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 venues that he had to work in and the amount of the body of work that he produced and uh, the the importance he had to the to the industry. I mean, it, it's it's impossible to compete compete with it. The venue was different. Um, many great illustrators have followed followed him, but. I just don't think there's anybody that would, you know, my dad would be the first one to tell you, um, that, you know, uh, yeah, Norman was the greatest illustrator that ever uh, walked the planet. And uh, the ability he had to communicate the emotion that he, you know, that he uh, uh, was able to develop. Um, I think many, even if, even, even if they don't work, their work is so different from Norman's. I think that um, everybody kind of tips their hat is I was the greatest illustrator that ever walked the planet. Um, I was just telling him, Francis, that I completely agree with you about Norman being the greatest illustrator that ever walked the planet. Um, my dad would have backed you up on that in a huge way. Um, you know, people have pointed to that group of Bernie and my father as being great illustrators. And I think they all just, you know, you know, all tip their hat to Norman. It's like, you know, how can you compete with that? Um, so um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. He, but the interesting thing is that when I was a student, I said, I'm going to make whatever sacrifice I have to do because that's the height of art. And now as I've gotten older, I've realized the sacrifices that Norman made and I've had to decide are those sacrifices um, right for me? because he devoted an awful lot of time to his pictures, but the results were incredible. Um, um, huge commitment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to mention to everyone that bear with me. Um, I might need to handle Akira in a bit again, but um, <laughs> we're OK. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we're just going to keep moving forward. So I mentioned these two pieces. I could talk for an hour about these, and John has helped me in the past articulate sort of the difference between these two, but I think the reason I'm pausing here is that the figure on the left is done very academically with an emphasis on accuracy, anatomy, and just capturing what was in front of me. And, uh, the figure, and that took maybe 12 hours, and the figure on the right was done in around 20 minutes, with much more emphasis on the emotion and the mark making and the life and the gesture. And I think that early on, as we are instructed in fig the figure, the tendency is to learn this approach on the left. And it becomes a good and bad thing. It's good to be able to draw what you see, but it can also suck the expression out of your work and make people nervous about making their own mark and questioning what's the right mark, accuracy or emotive. Um, and as a teacher, I see that quite a bit. And as my father would say, he said, I would much rather see 
an interesting drawing versus an accurate drawing. And uh, there is so much more interest and there's so much personal voice in what you're doing on the right um, that I think it's it's much more effective drawing. Um, and this is a really kind of an awkward thing to say, but the one on the left is easier to do. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and takes a lot of, of learning to be able to get there, but it's more difficult to be expressive with your drawing and still have it be drawn well. That's the catch is, is that the drawing chops, the acclimate of your drawing is still there, uh, but it has an emotional content to it that takes it beyond the academic. I couldn't have said it better myself. I'm... <laughs> I appreciate it, John. Yeah. And I, I learned that from you and your father and all the teachers at the academy. And I've just, from my observation, had the benefit of being around artists like those I just mentioned, and they helped me through that journey. And everyone here is also around similar artists that can mentor you on that journey. But um, I do agree that there's a safety net in accuracy. And if you're going to be the most accurate tight artist in the world, that's great. And there's not a reason not to do that. But um, I think giving yourself the opportunity to be a little bit more expressive and not worry if it's not perfect is something everyone should try to at least see the two sides of the spectrum. Um, and just to wrap up this thought, I figure if you honestly decide that you want to work in more realism and accuracy, that you should still do the more expressive drawings some of the time just to help keep the yin and yang accurate and keep liveliness in your drawing so they don't get too stiff. If you're gonna decide you wanna be a little more expressive, like on the right, every once in a while, you should do a little bit more academic study just to keep that mus those muscles tight and in check. And that will just keep your drawings on the right from getting a little too wonky. Okay, so just a whole bunch more figurative work. Um, some of these pieces like this one that are color are just very, very, very fast demonstrations in my figurative, uh, my figure drawing, figure painting classes. And uh, I'm a really big advocate in my figure work. And if we have time at the end, someone feel free to ask me to elaborate on this, but the idea of shadow massing and having a very clear separation of light and darks uh, is debatably the thing I'm most excited about in picture making. And that comes primarily from two people. One is Mike Mignola from Hellboy, and two is Gary Kelly. The way they design their light and dark shapes is endlessly inspiring to me and something I try to bring to my work. And it's what allows me to do a painting like this in maybe 20 minutes uh, to a half hour and still have a reasonably read. Um, and that... Well I've only had a couple of conversations with Mike McDonough, but I was blown away when he told me, uh, he, we were talking, this is before COVID and we were talking about him coming to the academy. And he, he told me, he said, I, I would love to come, but I need to come when Gary Kelly's there. And th that's actually said often. <laughs> um, Bill Sienkiewicz was the same way. Um, he said, but I need to be there when Gary Kelly's there. And he said, uh, you may not, he said, you, I'm sure you don't know this, but I own a Gary Kelly original that I keep right next to my drawing board. He's one of my biggest influences on composition. And um, and it, it makes total sense when I think about it. You know, you look back and think about it. I, I was going to bring up Gary when you were talking about drawing at the academy and the different types of drawing. I said, it would, it scared me. And it still does and intimidates you to sit and draw next to him yeah. because he draws and he's capable to rein it in and be really accurate with his drawing. But he doesn't really pay much attention. He's he's designing the page while you're while everybody else in the room, except for maybe George and my father are 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 they're they're drawing and making a beautiful drawing, a composition. His first fo his first focus is on the composition. And, and, and you, you, you know, you're done, you know, you get done at the end of the night and then, you know, you may think, oh, Gary just, you know, he didn't finish this drawing or he didn't, you know, and then you look at him and you're like, oh God, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> he was making beautiful pictures out of everything. <laughs> he was composing all of it beautifully. You're absolutely amazing artist. Well, I, I think it's over here. I don't want to waste time hunting for it, but uh, I had, commented on a Gary Kelly Facebook post and 
uh, he wrote something kind about my work and I proceeded to print that out and uh, tape it <laughs> on my studio wall. Um, I feel like I've really, I've made it. Um, Cause honestly, like as I've gotten in, in the industry, I've been in it about 13 years now, those little moments are more important than some of the medals and the recognitions. Like those are nice, but to have people you genuinely respect and influence your work to have well, anything positive to say about it, honestly is, and those are the most meaningful things by far. Oh, yeah. uh, I remember Brent Watkinson telling me one day that um, that Gary had called him and he said, I didn't even know he knew my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He yeah. was joking. Uh, they became very, very good friends. But, uh, but it, what it meant to, you know, have him say something nice about your work or even acknowledge it is... Yeah, that's what that's what we do this for. You know, you're not doing our. You know, that's the other thing I think of. A lot of emerging artists don't think about. It's like you don't really you make art for yourself, but you usually have a group of people you're making it for. I mean, it's like I'm doing this. Like, you know, in your case, you might be doing it for George Pratt or who, whoever. It's like I'm doing this because I want George to recognize this. And and and, uh, and I think it's interesting. You know, my my dad talked about the, you know the first five years of his career, he did everything for Bernie. He said that's all that's all he could think about is that I wanted to impress him because he thought he knew the most, um, which is interesting. And didn't Bernie want to impress your dad when he developed the oil painting technique? Yeah, it kind of, well, they became, that became an ongoing conversation for a long time. Um, but I think Bernie, you know, at the beginning, Bernie was very influenced by Austin Briggs. And right, right, was, right. Was, that was his muse when, uh, and uh, Kobe Whitmore, for sure. As I am. I mean, right yeah. now, draw, look at, look at Austin. Yeah, and Kobe. <laughs> so that that brings up a good point in that you know you get you start to get perspective on things, and just a, a tip for those that are developing as uh, figurative artists and just drawers and draftsmen, draft women as well. Um, it's it's easy to look at uh, accurate rendered. Uh, drawings as the goal when you're learning the figurative arts and for some people it is and they're going to continue down that path and, and make very Rockwellian or Ang or um, you know, Rembrandt-ish I suppose although that's not the best example but just very resolved realistic work um, but in the commercial illustration marketplace that has tighter deadlines um, being able to have a shorthand and to make simple work that's well designed uh, is massively important. And I teach my figure classes that the first half you learn to draw what you see, and then the second half is you learn to develop an opinion and interpret what you see. Um, and the second part tends to be unexpected, but where I think the most satisfaction comes from. And it'll, you'll never figure it out, which is a joy. You're going to spend the rest of your life trying to seek that out. And I think that goes to say why so many people respect someone like Gary that's developed such an individual perspective on what he sees, you know, because I think lawyers learn to read and artists learn to see and Gary can really see, you know, and I'm, I'm on my journey to, to see things myself and, you know, we're all working on it. So just a bunch more figurative pieces. Uh, these were done in an exercise. Um, I want to give a mentioned to Eric Olson, who developed this class and alley -ooped a lot of the lessons to me, where he teaches figure painting first, um, where you use black as the only shadow tone. And then once you can establish that, then you can start adding value and more subtle tones in the shadows. But it's a really useful exercise because um, it moves you from drawing and to keep thinking about uh, graphic shapes into painting. And then once you get good at this step, then you can you know, add more content. But at the same time, this could be seen as a finished piece, I think. I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out. And um, when I first saw that piece, that just knocked me out. It's a beautiful painting. Thank you, John. Yeah, and, and it's very fast. And it, it works towards my proclivities to like ink and all sorts of different things. Um, 
So figure is always a big deal. Um, for what it's worth, if, if you check my social sites over the coming months, I have hundreds of figurative pieces that I have to scan in. Um, in the coming weeks, when I start doing some demonstrations, I'll give you a little tour of my studio uh, and kind of show you how I'm structuring the scanning and flat files and all that fun stuff. Uh, just a warning, my dog might need my attention for a minute in a second. So if you hear a little squeaking, <laughs> uh, but before that happens, uh, I do have a section on comics and I'm an artist because of comics. We all start somewhere. And for me, it was Todd McFarlane and Spawn. And when I left school, uh, I didn't have a lot of space to go into my paintings, but uh, I just had my inking supplies and that's really all I needed. So I've semi-regularly up to this day uh, done these financial comics for a number of um, credit card companies in Australia out of all places. Uh, they take really dry subject matters like debt and investing. Um, and I have to make a really silly comic about it. And I kind of play with different styles and approaches and they're usually one page at a time, but they're fun to do, really great design exercises. Uh, this was a pitch for Boom Comics that never went anywhere. And I understand why this is the world's most complicated comic page. <laughs> um, but as far as getting to this point, you know, I, you heard my story about comics being a big deal when I was young. Then I went to art school and then I met George Pratt who reignited that, George the Master Comic Artist. Then uh, around this time, I had the opportunity to attend the world's first comic book residency in Florida. And I had three artists to choose to study with. Paul Pope, Svetlana, I forget her name, but she's an anime artist, um, or Craig Thompson. And I chose Paul because I was a big fan of his work. If you're not familiar with Paul Pope, check it out. He's called the rock star of comics, and it's, it's true. He's a type of artist that said, well, there's a reason that rock stars stand tall so the people in the back can see you. So he really brings a lot of flair <laughs> uh, to his work. So he would work on these giant, like 20 by 30 pages of Bristol with like a double zero ink brush. And when I was doing this work, that's what I was doing. It's absolutely inefficient and very exciting. Uh, so this was a really big transitional point for me. Uh, it started good and didn't end that great. And that I got an opportunity to do a full graphic novel with um, Soleil, who's a really top shelf publisher out of uh, Europe. And this was a big point for me because the work I did, I'm very pleased with to this day and I'm proud of, but the way I was approaching it was wrong and taught me the lesson that your artistic process and personality has to match the industry you're pursuing or you're going to have to change some things. And being such a Rockwell enthusiast, every one of these panels was intricately photo referenced with models and actors and 3D models and the whole works. And as a result, I think they turned out pretty good, but eventually I literally made myself sick working on this project. I ended up in the hospital for a variety of reasons because I was pushing myself too hard. Um, and I just wasn't getting the page rates out that I needed, meaning just the speed at which I was doing, they were taking too long. So eventually I had to step away from the project. Um, but, you know, with growing pains early in the career, but what happened is I realized I do love ink and I want ink to be a big part in my career. And also I need to find an outlet that allows me to uh, celebrate the extensive preparation and process work that I've realized I really like to do again, as a result of, of Rockwell. So I have a bunch more just pieces. From I have to back up a second uh, because I missed a question from Bill, that Bill Cobb asked. Okay. Um, and so it was like 15 minutes ago, and I hope we can figure this out. Uh, can you talk about the, the Bill piece? Was it an illustration or a painting to hang? Which piece? The Bill piece is all he... The Bill. Yeah. So maybe, Bill, you can explain that. <laughs> the, First, hey Bill, nice yeah. to, happy to have you here. Um, I'm not sure which piece you're referencing though. So if he types it out, let me know. Okay. 
Bill, capital B? Was it a, I don't know if it was an individual named Bill. Was it a Bill Sienkiewicz? Was it a Bill Clinton? Was it, <laughs> you got to give us a hint. Bull, Bill Bull is what he was. Uh, <laughs> oh, he, okay. He, he, uh, he had a typo in there. He had a typo. Right, right, right. He uh, just wants to know more information about it. Yeah, the Picasso piece, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, um, to I was in an interesting position when I was hired at the College for Creative Studies, where they, without getting into it too much, um, there was a lot of emphasis put on me getting my master's. Uh, so the leadership said I had to do that. So I did. Uh, I got it online via SCAD. And so this is one of the pieces I did in my class um, for an assignment to do an editorial piece on uh, mad cow disease. And as I mentioned, it was uh, right after I went to a Picasso exhibit and I was playing with some of these cubist elements and really was into shape stuff. Um, I had just finished Jazz Day, and in Jazz Day, I used some house paint, which owes its credit to Mark English. Um, so combining ink and Picasso and house paint um, and the concept of the mad cow disease, this is what happened. And uh, I recently, uh, Mercedes opened up a location in Detroit, and uh, I don't know why they bought this piece, but they thought this would be a good piece to hang in the Mercedes Financial Center in Detroit. So I, I will accept their payment for it. And, but it's uh, a beautiful piece. That's why. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, when you buy a Mercedes, you want to be reminded of mad cow disease, which. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, and, the, and the bull market. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bull. I appreciate that. <laughs> So let's catch up. So um, this was a recent-ish piece. Uh, this was a cover for Bitter Root and the excellent comic by Sanford Green, uh, image comic book. And this is a good story that shows you should like what you like and talk to people about what you like. So Sanford Green is an excellent comic artist and also a huge hip hop enthusiast. And over the years, we, I think we respected each other's art, but every time we got together, we would just talk about the new album that came out or who had the best verse on this song for quite many years. And then this book was doing really well. And he's like, hey, now that I can call the shots, I want to do a series of covers paying homage to a lot of hip hop cultural moments um, with my comics characters. So he hit up a bunch of artists he knew that liked hip hop. I was like, hey, Francis, do you want to do an homage to Juice? Um, that Was that it? Why am I spacing on the movie? It was, it was Juice, right? I feel like I'm... That's funny. I say that I'm an enthusiast, and then I might goof the name of the movie up. But anyways, <laughs> um, I, did, I did do this piece, and it was really fun um, to work with them on it. Um, this is a project I'm just currently working on. Some of these I just did about a week ago or so. But there's a studio in town here called First Fight that does excellent motion graphics. And they regularly hire me to basically have an open-ended prompt that every time they hire a new person to do this large ink pinup of them. Uh, and it's very cool to get projects like this because it pays really well. And they say, basically, do whatever you want. And, and I do. And you know I'm really thankful for them. And I, I give them the original and all those things. Uh, this is the close-up on an old comic panel that I, that I kind of liked. I've always enjoyed this sort of piece on the, on the left. Uh, these, this was actually a comic I did that got me back in the comics. This was in art school in George Pratt's class. And you can definitely see the Pratt influence wearing it on my sleeve there. Uh, this was for a, a card game that was released, I think, called Knights and Monsters. Uh, and this was me getting much more animated and, and stylized. Um, this was for the same company, and uh, it was for boxers. This is back to the monsters. Uh, this is definitely influenced by my caricature work, very stylized. And it's interesting to move from how I handled this referee here. Very loose, almost no construction, uh, very cartooned, to doing a very realistic charcoal drawing of a figure. And 
you know, that's kind of been my experience, right? Is trying to remedy or not remedy because that suggests there's a problem, but to, to quantify where my work exists within that spectrum. Um, I just have a couple pieces here that are re recreations of albums that I really like. Um, and I did all these digitally because there was a point when I did my Anansi Boy project where uh, the deadline was so insane that I needed to bring in some digital elements just to speed up the process. So this was a time where I used these pieces as just a test. Can I capture my traditional inking style digital? And I don't think I did. I think it's a little different style and that's okay. So now left to my own devices, I know when it's appropriate to do digital inking and when it's appropriate to do uh, traditional. And these are just more digital ink pieces. And you're getting a little taste of my music taste <laughs> as well. Uh, storyboards, I haven't done storyboards in years, maybe five or so years, but early on in my career, they were really big because uh, they paid well, they paid really well. And I was able to work on maybe more lesser paying jobs, but that I was more passionate about. Uh, and then I would take a storyboarding project to pay the bills. And this did come from my time in animation. And I learned about cinematography and everything at that time. So a lot of these were very commercial in the sense for actual commercials. And there was a few California studios that would just hire me. And I just know I wouldn't sleep for two days and I'd crank out 60, 70 boards uh, by hand. And now I probably do them digitally, but then I'd scan them in and this is what you would get. So these are commercials for not scary farm out in California. This is for Rolex. This was like for some investor thing where they wanted to pitch this interactive wall. Uh, this is for Honda. So again, I haven't done those in a while, but there was a period where I did a bunch and it definitely helped me stay afloat as an artist. Um, apparel. Uh, this was a lino cut that I composited with some traditional inking. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, Don Kilpatrick has been a really big motivator to see the beautiful printmaking work. And I should mention anything Don does is phenomenal, but um, his printmaking particularly, I really enjoy. And uh, I want to do more of it because this is one of the last pieces where I had such a big printmaking uh, influence. If you see me rolling back in my seat, because this young lady is looking to get her food. So that's <laughs> who's been barking in the background the whole time. Uh, so just a whole bunch of uh, older pieces here. Uh, this was something I did right around the time I left my grad school. So a couple of years ago when I had this idea to uh, do licensing and I still might do it. I had, I was really motivated at the time and then I got into other things. Um, but I'm like, what type of patterns might a little kid that grew up like me want to see? So I don't think I was that weird. I was definitely weird, but not that weird. There had to have been other kids like me. So like basketball, flames, shoes. <laughs> so we'll see if I ever get back to that. Um, this is a long-term project that I paused for a couple of years, but I worked in collaboration with Mad Gods, which is an apparel company out of Austin, Texas. And I made a whole lookbook and did some t-shirt designs and art directed it and took models into the forest and shot them with giant printouts of my uh designs and this was the studio in austin i just photographed some of our models and illustrated on top of it um so none of this work has actually been shared in public for a number of years um but it was fun it was fun to kind of flex my art direction skills i suppose and you can't go wrong photographing a dog in a shirt so that's all that work uh there so sketchbook uh Here's another observation that I've found is in teaching, most illustration programs are pretty arduous. And sometimes it can be difficult to do work outside of your assignments. And that's an issue. Uh, I think having time to do your art with no expectations, purely uh, to explore and to experiment and to apply some ideas that you have is really big. Um, and I've had a number of students regularly tell me they don't carry a sketchbook or they don't do work for themselves. They're just trying to get their, survive and get their work done. And I'll take some responsibility on that as a teacher. I think we have to 
encourage sketching and just open-ended work and play. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of my peers have, have discussed. And I just want to put it out there that if you've just found yourself not having done just work for yourself in a while, see what you can do to remedy that because that's where a lot of my development came from. So uh, a lot of these pieces I'm going to share were right at art school. Uh, that's when I was doing some of my most sketchbook work. I still do. I just haven't scanned it in a number of years. <laughs> I just was filling a page yesterday. Um, but it was particularly important at the time as a student because I was trying things like the image on the right where Mike Mignola copies from his comics. And then the image on the left was me just drawing my hand in a mirror and all these uh, lyrics are from like a Nas song that I was listening to at the time. Uh, I remember this piece, I inked it and then I lit it on fire from the back in my sketchbook. So now I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that indoors like I did. And I remember it catching on fire and putting it under the water in my sink, but I'm like, man, it's a cool texture. Uh, this was me just drawing straight with ink. This was really early, right around leaving art school. This was in art school. Um, but just a lot of different sketching. You know, I would just warm up in the morning and just draw stuff with straight ink. Um, I think I did this at the Illustration Academy. I never drawn cars. And like, what happens if I draw cars? And I just grabbed a couple pencils and did this. Um, out of art school, I wanted to continue getting better. So I would just pull up subject matter and every morning warm up and just do a ton of those drawings. So like I picked basketball one day, another day I just wanted to pick expressions, another day horses, um, very much Pratt influenced. A little anatomy study and more hands. So this is still all art school time. I remember <laughs> skulls, this is rap battles. I wanted to draw kids and some really scary kid faces in here. Um, older men, really good exercise just to try to step things up. Uh, me trying to render softer, really influenced by Klimt. Uh, going to the beach and being a nerd and sketching at the beach, it's always a good place to sketch. Uh, ink drawings, sketchbook early. This is early, early, early. This is like a sophomore in art college, inspired by my caricature work. A little later on, a lot of figurative work, my shoes, figure, uh, just doodles of folks on camels, drawing my dog. I grew up with German Shepherds. I heard that Degas, I think, sprayed his drawings with milk and it gave it a weird soft feel. Uh, I've always liked, liked these drawings. I wanna do it again. And I think it's a certain type. I forget if it was skim milk or what. I'd have to look it up. So don't quote me on that. But these are drawings I did that I sprayed with milk. So just experiments, art school experiments, playing around. Master copies, it's a brew log and, and a meal free on it. I continue to do a lot of master copies just to learn, you know, there's nothing better than a day at the museum just sketching from some statues or paintings. So still art school time. My first trip with like $10 in my pocket to San Diego Comic Con trying to survive. <laughs> it was a good time. My first trip to New York, like a 22 year old did this sketch at a figure session. So one of my heroes, Alex Toth, uh, I have students study his work quite a bit because I think he's one of the masters of shorthand to get the most efficiency out of line work. Uh, it's a very useful tool in your ideation and your sketching. Uh, there's no reason you have to do a ton of work to represent anything if you can just accomplish it very simply. And he's been very influential in the comic world. So I continue to uh, copy his drawings quite a bit. Uh, this was at the Illustration Academy. I did this painting of Johnny Winter. Just some exploration. The fun story with this one is that I was working on this. This is me at the Academy again. And Gary Kelly came up to me and said, those are good drawings, but they're too busy. And he uh, did a sketch of the drawing, way more simplified, way more successful. And uh, he left and he left it there. I'm like, well, he, you're going to take it? I'm like, surely he's not going to let me have one of his drawings. And he did. And it's framed in my studio. 
That was a really big moment. Um, I'm going to move a little faster because there's still quite a bit I want to cover. I, I want to give some time for, for some questions if, if there are any at the end. So just a lot more art school sketchbook stuff. A lot of exploration. A little you bit scared more everybody, Francis. <laughs> um, this is copying Sergio Topi, who remains one of my favorite ink artists. So these are copies. All right, so here's a little bit more contemporary sketching. Um, at the point when I was doing my master's, I was in my grad studies, I was very busy. So I had decided I was going to do more stuff digitally. Um, I've since went to more traditional since then, but there was a period where I was doing a lot of sketching like this. Um, so these are maybe three years old or something like that. Um, this is my dog you just seen. Her name's Akira and she's the coolest. Um, so these are just some digital sketches kind of playing with different ways to handle that. Uh, more digital sketching. Uh, this was a, a doodle I did for a class to show them how to use a parallel pen. This might be a technique I demonstrate in the coming weeks where uh, it's a combination of overly loose traditional to take advantage of the mistakes and expressive nature of traditional work monochromatically. Then the digital coloring of the piece. And it's maybe less coloring is the right word, as is manipulation. Uh, Photoshop was designed to manipulate images. Um, and it's great. If you take a really loose traditional grayscale piece, there's so many options on how you can bring that to a finish digitally. So anyways, I might, I might show this technique. I'm kind of still debating. Um, this was a time where I wanted to show some students how you can use digital tools to, and in a number of different ways. So I did all these different heads with the same reference. And I think this captures my interest in just mark making and, and aesthetics in general, almost in a scholarly way. Like what are the different ways you can approach a piece? And in a technical way, how can I get digital tools to look different? Um, and I'll, I'll make a comment to folks that are doing uh, digital work that I think digital doesn't allow for mistakes as much. Now, there's new programs and new methodologies that I'm seeing that are amazing and pretty much uh, completely, you can't tell it's digital versus traditional. I'm not getting into a debate what's better. Absolutely. I think they're both beautiful tools. Um, but I feel that it's a little harder sometimes to make mistakes. So um, these were pieces that I tried to bring the same beautiful mistakes in my traditional pieces into the digital ones. And I tried to use the same approach that I would take from my traditional experiences into digital. Like for instance, this was trying to capture cut paper and I tried to imagine my lasso tool was scissors and I wasn't allowed detailed shapes because of the bluntness of scissors. And I tried to layer it in a way that I would layer it traditionally. So to get the most rich digital marks, I feel many times it has to come from the truth of traditional experimentation. Um, there's definitely artists that refute that and have been digital most of the way through and have beautiful work, but um, so a uh, question uh, of the of the four heads, what would you say all four are your style? That's a great question. Uh, this one, this top left one. I did that one specifically saying this is me doing myself. So yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so these are some digital figure drawings. Uh, just trying to take my traditional approach, real sketchy graphite approach, um, digitally. And I was actually surprised that these turned out as they did. I thought they were pretty close to my traditional figures. Uh, some more digital figure work here. And the crazy thing is I barely know anything about digital brushes. Um, but I was pleased that I was able to take all my hand-done experience and kind of goof around with brushes for a half hour and get some pretty decent results. And I don't say that as an ego thing. I just say it again as hopefully proof that um, effort put into the time learning traditional tools is very worthwhile, even if you know you're going to move uh, digitally later on. Uh, this was a demonstration on value grouping. I love some good value grouping. It's a beautiful, beautiful puzzle. And one of my favorite acts of 
uh, the picture making process is when you get to the value studies. And I found a lot of resistance and I regularly hear annoyance in students' voices when they get to value study time. Um, and I think it's my favorite part because you are the god of your domain. Uh, your picture can do whatever you want and you can take the realistic rules of the world of light and form, but then design them in a way that's specific to your goals, the needs of the picture and your visual um, aesthetic interests. And it's just so fun, you know, it's, it's, it's a blast. But I will say, if there's anyone in here that wants to get into value grouping, it's a requirement to know how to interpret reference. Because a lot of times it's easy just to get in and copy reference, but to know that if you're drawing this figure and it's from a photo, that there's probably surely going to be some deep darks in the nose and on the cast shadow of the breast and the contact point with these knees in the ground. But you have a design in mind to group these values and you know to not insert those darks even though the reference says that um, and that interpretation of um, source material is is a, is a skill and it's something that i went through and still trying to go through and a lot of students go through too so i wanted to mention that okay so i'm actually doing decent on time so I've worked on two major book projects uh, in my career. The first being Jazz Day, which I'm gonna go through here. Uh, the second was Anansi Boys with Neil Gaiman. Um, I think Jazz Day put me on the map and Anansi Days, uh, or I'm sorry, Anansi Days. <laughs> Anansi Boys kind of really, I think, uh, for what it's worth, I don't know, solidified kind of my space in, in publishing. Um, so I'm not gonna go over Anansi Boys today because uh, I'm pretty sure one of these days I'm going to take you in hopefully positively excruciating detail through every step of that process. Uh, and hopefully for the people interested in publishing and process work, hopefully that'll be interesting for you. So that's going to be in a future one of these talks. Um, today, I'm just going to show you some of my JASD work. So if you remember, uh, I had mentioned the failures in the comic world at the time and that my process and how I approached the comics wasn't conducive to the realities of productivity that you needed in comics, which is basically like a page a day or something in that ballpark. I was spending too long. So after that challenge, uh, I stumbled into literally um, comics. It was very, very, or I'm sorry, books, kids' books. Uh, I feel guilty sometimes because I've watched people and spoken at conferences and heard stories of people submitting for 10, 20 years to get their first published kids book. And I just was emailed out of the blue from Candlewick Press, who happens to be an amazing client, saying, hey, we know you haven't done any kids books, but we have this one called Jazz Day. Would you like to work on it? We found one of your images on a Google search. So that's the very charmed way I broke into kids books. Um, I had no ever, intention ever of doing a kid's book. I really was wanting to do comics or editorial or something. Um, but the reason that was so substantial is that I was working in a very meticulous process, heavy, experimental, long style in very fast paced industries. And I was getting decent work, but I had no life. All I did was art and sleep and maybe eight sometimes. Um, and I was starting to get frustrated after a while. I'm like, man, this, there's got to be a little more than this. This just, I don't think it has to be this painful. So by the time I got into uh, books, they asked me, everyone, this was crazy. They asked me, how long do you want to work on this project? I'm like, what? That exists? I've never been asked that. It's always due yesterday. So I remember um, a girl I was dating at the time, I, I told her about how blown away I was at I felt with that question and I'm like, well, I'm just going to give them the craziest time. Uh, and they're then they'll probably counter. So I said three years and they said, OK, and I was like, whoa. Um, so I was taking a big risk that I didn't realize at the time, but. Um, I got twenty five thousand dollars to work on this book. And at the time that was like, this is infinite money. I'm rich. I didn't realize that. 25,000 over three years is poverty money, almost, um, at least to live in where I, where I was living at the time. 
And I didn't consider any of that. I'm like, this is the amount of time that I need to make good work that I really want to make. So the risk was figuring out a way to live off that money. And I would take work on the side just to survive. Um, but hopefully it would be worth it and I'd get a good product. And that's what happened. And the, the book was really successful. So I want to give you that context about how I got to that point. So it was a, the reason I think I was able to do that is it was a nonfiction prose book on jazz. So that doesn't necessarily scream sales. <laughs> um, so they were, there was more of a like passion project and they literally told me as much that it was a project that might win awards. Um, and this was their words, that it might win awards and get some medals and make them look impressive as a publishing house. But Captain Underpants was gonna actually sell the, the units, but they like to put out projects like this. And it's sort of like A24, the uh, film company, a production house, you know, sometimes their films don't, um, sell like Marvel numbers, but they get a lot of respect and they're able to make that work for themselves. So um, that worked out for me. So uh, this was the book, you know, I, I did all the art. Um, so these are just some stats. I was Candlewood Press. It was written by Roxanne Orgo. I illustrated it. It was 20 paintings. I began November 2015 and finished February 15. So not fully three years, although I did go beyond that deadline a bit. Um, I was commissioned for loose full color paintings. I should mention that um, <laughs> I had only done black and white work for about four years before that. So they said full color paintings. I'm like, sure, I can do that. But I was awfully nervous. So I have a million artists I look at, um, as you probably got that impression, but these are some of the influences. The biggest influences were Bernie Fuchs, Gary Kelly, Tadahiro Uesugi who is um, this artist, amazing artist, uh, Norman Rockwell. And then the secondary artists were Albert Dorn, uh, Maurice Noble, who did the backgrounds for Looney Tunes, 101 Dalmatians, Paul Madonna, who did this work here, uh, and Svetlin Vasilev, who's like a contemporary Gustav Klimt inspired uh, illustrator. Not too many people know his work, but everyone I show it to loses their mind. He's a Greek, Greek illustrator. So I'm gonna move through this pretty fast. Um, just because there's some more things I want to talk about, but uh, I show some of my earliest thumbnails, very loose. You can't even tell I know anything about drawing, but that's okay. I was just trying to get the layouts. So I did travel to New York on my own dime to shoot photo reference in Harlem. Before you get too far, I have to ask what size were the paintings? Uh, 22 by 30. They were acrylic and uh, pastel. And I did the sketch, well, I did part of the sketches digitally and then I printed them out on watercolor paper. So I had Jacle ink lines um, on watercolor paper. And then I worked on top of those lines with acrylic and pastel. Um, I shot extensive photo reference. I had a whole team of individuals that dressed in costume. So this was me at the photo shoot. This is some of the photo reference, really trying to keep the spirit alive of the Piles and Rockwells and Mark Englishes and Gary Kelly's and Chris Payne's of shooting really high quality photo ref. Um, I was just heard a lecture by Sam Weber and he was talking about how he still emphasizes shooting his own reference because um, you earn the originality if you're just using internet ref and even AI to a point which we'll talk about. Um, chances are other people are using that ref and it's very efficient and it's very seductive to use that as your main source material, but um, there's just something about getting your own reference and moving the light around an actual subject can't be beat. It's much more your picture. Absolutely. And we tend to lock ourselves in the studio. Imagine that getting to interact with people. <laughs> um, that's a good thing. So this is the point everyone's like, you're crazy. But uh, I had a 3D model of New York made. Um, I downloaded this back part and then I commissioned a former student off my specs to build the block of New York um, that most of this book took place in. So I did that top sketch. And then uh, if you remember Miles Wadsworth, John, he's who um, sculpted oh, yeah. this for me. Yep. He's killing it. He's a big time 3D modeler. And I think 
a bunch of game studios. Um, so to show how I use that, I would bring in a camera and I'd warp the lens like a fisheye lens so that it compositionally could accommodate what I was trying to go for. And, you know, I would use this reference here and, you know, and pieces like that. And I know I did this in Blender, or I'm sorry, I did it in Maya. I know a lot of people are doing this more in Blender nowadays. I'd also use it to light the scene so I can figure out ways to simplify very complex layouts. So these are my uh, sketches. I did these traditionally and then I scanned them in. It looks something like this. If you see Akira right there, it's really happy to put her in, in there. I actually dedicated the book to Akira. Everyone's like, oh, you dedicated it to your daughter. I'm like, no, it's my dog. <laughs> um, but she was great emotional support when I was just grinding to finish this book. So just a bunch Bill, of more sketches. Bill Cobb asked the question, when did you learn to be, to be so thorough about your reference and costuming, et cetera? Uh, Pratt, that was George. That was 100% George. And then, and then I, I did attend a lecture by uh, Chris Payne when he was jumping up and down, screaming at people how he went about his ref shoots at the Illustration Academy. And I connected the dots that literally all of my favorite artists shot extensive ref. So it's pretty obvious. I'm like, well, this is simply what I got to do. You know, there's no question about it. Um, so yeah, these were what the value studies look like. They were traditional. Uh, and then I digitally did color comps. These were style tests to figure out how I wanted to do the project. Uh, this was the one I locked in where I did a pretty loose acrylic painting and did pastel on top. So it has loose expressionistic painting and refined just enough with dry media on top. Uh, this is me delivering the paintings to the client. Uh, I hadn't cut my beard. I said I wouldn't cut my beard until I finished it. And I haven't slept in two days. So I'm surprising I look alive there. That was a crazy time. Uh, this shows a close up on, you know, one of the pieces. And these are what the finishes look like. So I, I will say that I fought with the publisher. I love Candlewick, but I didn't love at the time that they wanted to photograph my pieces. They said that was an absolute must, that they had to photograph them. And I was very used to scanning in the work at the time. Um, again, love Candlewick, but I was right. My pieces, you can kind of tell here, were warped. And they didn't straighten them out or anything. So they were ready to print. And this book I spent almost three years on pieces that you could tell, tell were bent and wobbly in the final book. So I had to really fight with them to send me the final files. And I ended up putting like two more months just to photo correct um, the pieces. And just cause I was in there already, I made a couple like digital enhancements here or there. Um, so I'm like, man, if I gotta do all this work I'm just gonna use this opportunity to, you know maybe improve the pieces a bit. So these are some of the finishes. Um, this book did really well for me. Um, the, the risk paid off. It was the most awarded book um, of that year. Um, it was in the conversation for the Caldecott. Uh, I didn't get it, but it was cool to be in the near the end of, of that award. And it did get the Hornbook Award and uh, six stickers. So if you see on the cover of kids' books, they have those, um, or not stickers, six um, medals. I forget what they call them, but it did really well. I was very pleased. It didn't sell much, but it gave me a lot of legitimacy in, in the, uh, the picture book industry. Um, again, back to Rockwell. Rockwell has a piece that he never finished that was this basic composition. And this was a nod to him. Um, I finished his piece and that was kind of like sentimentally pretty cool for me. And um, this book kind of sent me on a tour across the country. And one of my last stops was I presented it at the Norman Rockwell Museum and did a demo. And by now, you know how big of a deal he is to my work. So that was an absolute life highlight. Uh, and if you want to watch it, they actually recorded it. So if you throw my name into YouTube with Norman Rockwell, you can watch the like hour and a half demo I did there. So this piece did well for me. It is my favorite piece from the book. Um, and I think it, I tried to pull out all my tricks from 3D to, um, I shot two different sets of photo ref to get the girl just right because she was so nervous. And, um, but in the end, it was worth it. 
And so that shows a close up. Um, and then I discovered that when you put out books, people want to hear what you have to say about them. Um, and I went on a uh, talking tour and this was coincided when I was starting to teach and I was relatively an introverted to myself fellow, but with teaching and going on a tour here, I realized that even though I was in general sort of a nervous person socially, if it came to art, I can do it all day long. I'll start yelling at you how much I'm excited about something. And I've since realized that talking to people about art, whether it's little kids or college students or whomever, um, is something I really like to do. And I've had a lot of mentors in my past that were world class and changed my life. And the opportunity to pass that on and pass that forward is something that I'm very privileged to, to have the opportunity to do. And um, now there's generations of artists that have studied under me and amongst other artists. And that's just the coolest thing. And um, sometimes they have nice things to say and I continue to tell them, I'm like, just pass it on. And I, I'm now old enough to have taught extensively students that are successful professionally and aware that they're teaching young people. That's crazy, right? So now I'm like firmly in the tree of influence. And I think that's what's beautiful about the industry is um, there is that lineage and so many people wanting to share their information. And um, I've never, I, I have encountered artists that were secretive, but most of the time artists are just excited to tell you every secret they know because they had to fight for it. And, you know, I, I can go on a while about how beautiful the circle of life is with, with this sort of stuff. So I have a few more things I want to cover. If anyone has questions, um, feel free to just throw them at me. But at this point, um, I wanted to bring something up because I noticed it's not spoken about too much. Um, caricatures, commercial caricatures are awesome. They're very cool. And my arc doing them was that initially I just wanted a summer job uh, for when I came home for the summer. And I'm like, ah, oh, characters are low end art. They're low brow. Um, I'll just gonna do this to make money in the summer. But what I realized is it, wildly helped my confidence and my line work and it's a blast you're sitting in front of people you're practicing the social element of being a human being um, you're meeting very interesting people and you're able to educate them about art um, and, and tell them you know because regular the most regular question i get is this is a cool hobby what do you actually do um and i'm really i try to be nice but i'm like actually i make a career out of drawing and talking to people about drawings like really you know, and then now they leave the interaction knowing a little bit more about art. Um, and I'll say it pays great. It's maybe the best paying thing I do. Um, so I'll give you some stats. You know, most gigs are three to four hours, maybe sometimes two hours. I charge 125 an hour and usually I'll get maybe $100 worth of a tip. So if you do the math, I put in a couple hours, um, I'm pulling, you know, $500 plus. And that's easy money because I barely feel like I'm working. I'm just doodling, having a fun time. Um, and I'm lucky that I'm in a major city in Detroit and I pretty much have unlimited gigs because I have a booking agent and they just book for me. So I get that there's a level of privilege and just the setup I have is pretty premium. But um, if you want to make some good money and you're in a major city that has some sort of need for caricatures, uh, it's a blast. And now I firmly don't look at it as lowbrow anymore. I, I consider it uh, just as important as any of the other work I do. And um, it's great. I, I like it a lot. So I just wanted to put it out there that that could be a, a fun thing for people to try. So these are just some samples of the caricatures I do. Um, probably my number one influence is Al Hirschfeld. Uh, if you don't know his stuff, he has some of the best line work ever. Um, and most of these are done, like a color piece like this might be 20 minutes, but um, a black piece, black and white piece like this might be 10, 15 minutes, you know. That's interesting, uh, Francis. Uh, when I was in high school and uh, Blackshear, Tom Blackshear was um, interning for my father, he used to do the same thing. He used to go set up on the street in the plaza area of Kansas City and then go out to the uh, Worlds of Fun on the weekend and do caricatures of people. Uh, you would never guess it from what he does now 
but he was and he was very good at it um i actually have one that he did of uh, he did a did one of my father for fun um but um i know quite a few people that have that have done that throughout the years it's it's a it's a great experience um it may the best part of it might be the interaction with you making art in an audience <laughs> um that that's that's something that's hard to you know some people have uh, some people that are artists that are very shy um it's a good experience to to get through that and maybe cure that a little bit Agree, because I was as apprehensive of an artist as you would have met. I was when I was a young person. I was covered in paint. I was pretty passionate, but I could barely work my way through a conversation. Um, but I mean, especially on my art side too, when you're sitting in front of someone with a marker and no real under sketch, and they're going to only pay you if they like the drawing, you have to get confident, or you're not going. You're not going to survive. You won't be able to do caricatures. Um, I now get paid a flat rate. So if they don't like the drawing, no big deal. But when I started, that's what was happening. And um, I think the, the confidence I had when I'm doing oil painting doesn't seem connected, but I think that came from um, my characters. And just wanted to put that out there. Uh, I'm not yeah, sure how come, time come join us on Thursday night for our drawing because you can, you know, be put on camera in front of a few hundred people and the other people on camera is Chris Payne and Dale Stefanos and Bill Cobe and see if you don't tighten up a little bit. Cassandra Loomis. I mean, just uh, um, oh, that's it. it yeah. yeah, it's that same thing. It's that same thing. You know, uh, you get I, I, it makes you it makes you work a little harder. Sure. I mean, and I come from a sports background, you know, and you mentioned it too, John, and I know you do as well, that there's absolutely competition. It's friendly, but there's still competition and we want to get work that we think, you know, does a good job. Um, and for what it's worth, taking that character background, I tried to bring that exact exaggeration into this. This was a figure drawing from life. I, I went through it pretty fast earlier, but um, I was actually really proud of this piece. I'm like, finally, I was able to bring the wheels together it's a great um, great piece thank you bill saying come draw with us i say the same thing too we had uh, uh victor huhas um huhas draw with us the other night and it's like <laughs> come on man <laughs> he drew with his off hand the whole night um <laughs> well his his stories i'm sure of where he's drawn at destroy anything most of yeah. us can say you know yeah it's pretty cool um so a few more things, I, I'm recognizing the time, but uh, another slightly alternative thing that I want to put out there is um, I've had the great fortune of participating in a number of residencies in my career. Uh, and residencies are fantastic. It's basically opportunities that are privately or, um, what would you say, um, state funded, or they're just funded from a, a source that supports artists in room and board and an experience to make art, many times for art's sake. Um, sometimes they're fully paid for, sometimes you have to pay to go to them, but I've participated in maybe four or five residencies in my life and absolutely every one was a life, I wouldn't say life changing, some of them were more than others, but just were a highlight of, of my life so far. Um, and I'm doing another one coming up, you might get a kick out of, that's what the one that's here. Um, I've participated in Voices of the Wilderness program, which is a program with the US uh, Ranger Service in Alaska that it connects artists with uh, rangers to document the wildlife in Alaska in order to raise awareness of the wildlife in Alaska and to uh, lock in certain wild designations, meaning like, you know, there can't be man-made structures here, et cetera. So they use the drawings and the content for that purpose. So I originally, uh, maybe 10 years ago, went to Sitka, Alaska and absolutely changed my life. Um, and I'm going back in what's surely going to be the craziest adventure ever. Um, so I leave in a couple weeks and I'm going to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's the middle of nowhere. And next week I take bear training for six hours with the ranger. Uh, the ranger is going to have a rifle on him and I'm going to have bear spray. I'm also going to have a supplemental elk and moose 
uh, training in case um, they come into the water because um, they're so huge that if the water's not a certain depth, they can just walk right in the water. Uh, then I have to take helicopter training uh, when I get there because the only way to get to this area is via helicopter or small prop plane. Um, Francis, I really appreciate you doing this before instead of afterwards. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> make sure you got it in. <laughs> check this out. I leave the day after my final one of these. So on the fourth week, I will be leaving that next morning to go out here. So the timing worked out. That's awesome. So what's happening? What am I doing there? So they're going to drop me off in an area sort of like this. Um, and I'm going to be with two rangers. Uh, they're a husband and wife team, and we're going to go up 72 miles of river. So a lot of the transportation is going to be kayak. Um, the landscape basically looks like this, and most of the day is going to be floating. Um, and we'll take breaks to, to eat. We're going to have mobile campsites every night, uh, and we're going to do that for, I think, eight days. And they'll be shooting photographs, and I'll be sketching. Uh, the whole time i'll also be shooting photos to to uh, sketch or draw when they get back to the studio and then at the end uh it ends at a actually a space just like this and you'll notice this says audubon society so there's a world-class migration spot uh at the end of the the river um, where some of it's one of the most premier spots in the world for birds where they migrate, where scientists and biologists go to study birds. So that's going to be the final spot. And I'm going to hang out with them at that base camp. Um, basically, Robert Weaver journalistically documenting them, um, sketching them. And the cool thing is the sun doesn't go down, 24 hour sun. Uh, so that's going to be a trip. I've never experienced that. So after doing that two days, that brings it to 10 days. And then um, I'm sure I'll, I have really long hair now. I'm sure I'm gonna come back with like twice as much facial hair and uh, hopefully a little bit more mountain man style. And they're gonna helicopter us out of there back to civilization. Oh so gosh. that's coming up uh, very what kind of What kind of uh, documentation? I mean, are they, you gotta make sure that they're getting great shots of you doing this. This could be so unbelievably good for you uh, to promote with. Oh, I will. Yeah. So, so they're going to be shooting with their cameras and they actually are pretty decent photographers. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to request them take some shots of me doing my thing. So definitely there should be a lot of content. Um, so I'm looking at the time. I know it's important we stay on track. So I'm going to let you know what I have for AI. And I think the next time when I was going to talk about Anansi boys, I'm still going to do that. But I think I'll start with my AI talk. But um, this could be a good way to end um, and something that'd be for everyone to chew on because I, I came across this quote and I've been thinking about it regularly. Um, so one of the most significant educators ever in illustration is uh, Harvey Dunn. And he learned from Howard Pyle and then Harvey Dunn taught a million illustrators um, like, like Dean Cornwell. And so there's a book called In the Classroom by Harvey Dunn and it contains I think uh, not, uh, it's like eight hours of a critique and just his random notes from one session. And it's life changing for artists. Um, but anyways, I digress. Um, so Dean Cornwell studied with Dunn and has a lot of his philosophies. Because if you know both of their teachings, you'll realize that this quote I'm going to read is very much very done like. So in AI, a lot of it is text to image. So you type in a prompt and then images come out or are created by artificial intelligence and it's daily becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I, it's my opinion that it's going to be a massive um, influence in commercial and just art and imagery in general coming up. We're at the midst of a huge paradigm shift. And I'm not anti it. I'm very intrigued to see what happens. But I think there's this note is worth considering that art is a language complete and distinct from literature. Anything that can be said in words is not a subject for a painting. That idea is fueling the direction I want to take my work as well as the content from this book called Future Proof, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation. And next time we come together, 
Um, I'm gonna read through some of these passages because it gives legitimacy to stubborn artists that still want to make handmade work. Um, it, it argues it very, very well and eloquently better than I could. Um, so this is actually a good cliffhanger um, for next time we get together. So these are some topics I'd like to cover. But um, but that was fun, everybody. Um, I know we want to wrap up pretty much on time, but I guess is there any last questions? Yeah, I'm gonna let's let's give it a minute or so here. I can see Don Kilpatrick is typing something. Okay. Uh, but if anybody's got a final question or um, anything they want to say, please do. Okay, uh, Don just made a comment that the intellectual property implications of these AI generated images is what concerns me. We can discuss that next time. Um, Francis, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is just like end it and say thank you so much. This is a really good time to end it. Everybody, I hope I know you got your money's worth. Um, we got three more nights with Francis and um, Francis, you put a big smile on my face always. So thank you, my friend. I'm glad you're here. Of course. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll see you uh, next Monday. Take care of yourselves. Have a great night, everybody.